Recording in progress. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning and welcome to this session. And I'm glad that uh, people who are uh, physically present here and also people who are online. So this session uh, is uh, the fight against internet shutdowns and the role of multilateral for our like G20. I think India is going to host G20 uh, soon, uh, as far as I understand. And we have uh, five, uh, including me, speakers. So we have Radhika Jalani, Usma Kilji, uh, me, myself, Wei Pio Mint, and Narmata Maheshwari with uh, us uh, speaking online. Uh, so I will introduce uh, the speakers one after another, and you will get a little bit more about why we are uh, 
presenting uh, this session about the shutdowns and the role of G20 or fora such as G20. So our first speaker today is Radhika Jhalani. Radhika Jhalani is a counsel of SFLC in a legal service organization that works to protect freedom in the digital world in India. SFLC represents people's interest in the technology space through education, research, policy engagement, and the provision of legal services. Altogether, we have one hour time. Can I invite Radhika to take over and introduce us uh, to the subject and the other issues that we are going to discuss today? Uh, Radhika, please. Um, Radhika, I can step in here if you'd like. Great. Uh, yes, thank Radhika. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Farooq Fazal. I'm really happy you were able to join us. Thank you all for everybody present there in person and those who are joining online. I'm sure um, for those of us online, it's early in the morning or late in the night. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, well, I'll get us started. The story of internet shutdowns in Asia entails violation of rights, continuing impunity and damaging effects on democracy as well as employment and the economy. They often throw a curtain over the ground realities in regions going through conflict in a way that hampers reporting and shields abuse. It is also one that is plagued with dichotomies. Digital services and promises for greater inclusion are on the rise, but so are efforts to block access to the internet or specific social media platforms. The scale of impacted communities in Asia the rise of the tech sector and the considerable user bases for online platforms as well as government provided online services are at odds with the rampant shutdowns that deprive people of the ability to exercise their rights and avail of essential services. As Asian countries prepare to take the center stage at various international fora like the G20 and other summits, which, as Mr. Farooq Faisal mentioned, India is presiding over this year, this is a reconciliation that must be made. To shed more light on this issue, we have with us experts from India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Pakistan, where access is often blocked. I'll quickly introduce the other speakers. Uh, Osama Khilji is the director of Bolobi, a not-for-profit organization working on advocacy, policy, and research in the areas of gender rights, internet access, digital security, and privacy in Pakistan. Mr. Farooq Faisal, who you just heard from, is the regional director for Bangladesh and the South Asia region at Article 19, with over two decades of experience in international development, journalism, communications, and other fields. Wei Mint is the Asia Pacific Policy Analyst at Access Now, an international organization working to defend and extend digital rights and free speech globally. She has been instrumental for digital rights advocacy on Myanmar. And finally, I'm your moderator, Namrata Maheshwari, I'm Policy Council at Access Now, and I lead our work in the South Asian region. Um, it's lovely to be here. And again, we'll um, have one hour in all. We will try to reserve time towards the end for questions from the audience. So please feel free to um, note them as you uh, think of them. Uh, Radhika, I could, uh, I'd like to perhaps start with you. I'm just going to fix my view so that I can see you on my screen. Right. And while I do that, uh, Mr. Farooq Faisal, can you hear me clearly there? again can you hear can me you hear... yes i can hear you yeah so what did you ask me is my audio clear there yes your audio is very clear perfect thank you thank you uh, radhika emerging technologies and digital inclusion seem to be at the heart of india's commitment to the g20 india has also been ranked number one on digital payments globally and yet it has remained the country with the highest number of shutdowns for five years in a row. How can one understand these twin impulses to digitize public services on one hand and use shutdowns to stop people's access to internet services on the other hand? Right, thanks Amrita for your question uh, and thank you everyone for joining uh, this early and this late at night. Uh, you know, I like to think of shutdowns as knee-jerk reactions, right? It's a, you know, we all countries across the globe are trying to sort of fight against misinformation and disinformation. The path that India has chosen, <coughs> sorry, 
<laughs> is of cutting down access to internet right even with like the smallest of things for example cheating in examinations for example uh, you know small public order situations internet shutdowns are are way to you know uh, other things that we pull right the way uh, i think it's easy a i b i don't think that uh, people really understand the impact the authorities don't really understand the impact of shutdowns what they do right there um, as you said there are a lot of our in economies informal economy you know you would uh, see these street hawkers street peddlers on the streets taking upi payments upi payments would be an equivalent of paypal payments um, you know that you just scan a code and you pay none of us after especially after the demonetization exercise have um, you know keep a lot of cash on us because payments are easy right but uh, shutdowns uh, the, and unfortunately the only argument that the government seem to understand are of you know an economic angle so if you give them a number that hey listen this is the uh this is this uh, this is the net loss that's uh, uh you know that happens when uh, we shut down the internet uh that's something that they might be able to understand the unfortunate part is that there are no comprehensive studies internet shutdowns are also a recent phenomena if you see in india according to the tracker that we maintain and uh, according to all the access now keep it on reports we've had a 750 Seven hundred fifty-eight shutdowns in India since 2012. Right now, we are on 66 shutdowns in 2023 itself. The number is a lot. If you categorically look at it, you will understand that you know, um, in some part of India, uh, there is one internet shutdown per day. The numbers uh, are scary, but also. It's, i mean our governments don't our government of india doesn't even maintain an official record of shutdowns uh, and that has been answered in the parliament multiple times there's no record of the losses there's no study there's no investment and in resources to understand what internet shutdowns do and there is no or there is also no sort of will to figure out alternatives to it everybody is dealing with hate speech i understand that the country is very uh, you know uh, uh, is very diverse and there are always communal tensions on high but uh, internet shutdowns are definitely not the way including selective banning of internet which government is now resorting to over to you namrata thank you radhika uh, mr farooq faisal if i could come to you next please um, bangladesh has also made headlines for throttling internet access Uh, sometimes to undermine protests and rallies, sometimes in other contexts, this collusion between um, what the law enforcement authorities or government authorities are trying to achieve and telecom service providers who uh, they they chalk it up to infrastructural lapses. Uh, it also undermines democracy as a whole. Uh, what local narratives are being tried uh, to be suppressed here, and is there any way that the impact of shutdowns is made worse? by existing um, what have been called draconian legislations like the digital services act yeah can you hear me yes we can hear you thank okay. you yeah uh, thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, in bangladesh we are also noticing uh, what happened in kashmir when the conflict started and and the shutdown happened and in bangladesh uh, the shutdown happened uh, with the refugees that uh, took shelter from uh, myanmar in bangladesh but bangladesh government because this is kind of um, uh, the legitimacy of this current government is uh, very uh, uh, in question and though uh, bangladesh is not a member of g20 but uh, the bangladesh prime minister sheikh hasina hopefully going to delhi to attend uh, g20 this year so bangladesh government current government is in power for 15 years and they hope to continue uh, for that you're saying not 15 years yes yeah this government is here for 15 years and they want to contest again next uh, election which is coming in january and they want if they could take the whole control of the online uh, version but uh, the internet platforms uh, owners are not listening to bangladesh government and 
Bangladesh government is trying to create an at atmosphere of uh, self censorship and fear. That's the that's why they created Digital Security Act just before the last election and in 2018. Since then, we along with other uh, uh, actors are protesting about this. And after a long time, the government has agreed to do some reform, reform of this uh, law and change the name of this one called instead of Digital Security Act, they will call it uh, Cyber Security Act. But this act is not for safety and security of citizens. This is actually uh, to ensure the uh, what you call the absolute power of the current government uh, to control people and create uh, self-censorship. Uh, and uh, so that nobody says anything in, in this end of this current government. But what we are protesting is that this this law has to be for the citizens benefit in that sense and we also want that the, even the government is changing the name of this law and changing some of the uh, punishment in some ways uh, we are not satisfied with that our demand is that since 2018 when the law came and up to now and at least two people are killed uh, under uh, in custody under the Digital Security Act. Many people are in the jail without any trial, and uh, many people had to leave the country and uh, go abroad. So we want a independent judicial inquiry of misuse of this law for, since 2018 up to the change now, which we are not happy, and we want the government to publish a kind of white paper and bring those people who are involved with uh, misuse of this law uh, and uh, punish them and bring them to justice. So that's what we are doing in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Vaithu, are you here? Could I ask you the next question? Yes, I can hear you well. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Um, in, so in Myanmar, uh, the junta has been known to regularly employ internet shutdowns over the past two years. Uh, in fact, Myanmar has, has been witnessing the longest ongoing internet shutdown, which exceeded 540 days in March 2023, but correct me if I'm getting that wrong. And all 330 townships across the country have been subjected to shutdowns at least once in 2022. What does internet access mean for the people of Myanmar? Thank you. Thank you so much, Anamata. Um, yeah, just to give you a bit of like a background. So, I mean, many of you are aware that uh, we, uh, it has been like a few and almost two and a half years now. Um, the military basically trying to um, uh, take um, uh, control the the whole nation through a violent coup. So, but the thing is like it, uh, especially on the internet shutdown issue. So since the very first day of the coup, you know, what we have experienced in Myanmar is like a, basically like a, the first thing military did is like a shutting down internet you know this is like a nationwide internet shutdown including even the uh the television channels and etc and then um what we have been seeing in these like at uh, last uh two and a half years is like at uh, um repeated by violations by the military uh, especially in terms of like at um uh are uh, trying to restrict, you know, people access to internet and also trying to control, you know, like uh, people like uh, sharing information and, you know, etc. So that's what we have been seeing there. So for the last um, two and a half years, uh, you know, we have seen about various types of internet shutdowns there, and also like uh, many times of the internet shutdown as well. Like, for example, like uh, what we have seen about nationwide internet shutdown, we have seen uh, uh, seen like uh, even like uh, even based internet shutdown, we have seen like uh, 
regional, you know, regional focus, international dams. And also, in addition to that, what we have seen about it is um, also um, uh, IB based, you know, internet shutdown, like a, a thousands of websites also has been already, you know, like a banned by the military, including um, uh, messaging platform, social media platform, like, for example, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, you know, um, people inside the country cannot use them without having, uh, using the VPNs, you know, etc. So those are. Um, uh, kind of like at, uh, the types of internet shutdown. And then, and also what we have seen about it is military also um, um, uh, did it like at uh, several like uh, policy amendments, you know, policy changes, policy reforms. Um, do we able to restrict, you know, people access to internet systematically? Like for example, there was like a pushing out like at uh, this like a SIM card uh, mandatory registration. And also like a raising these like a data price, um, uh, and also like a threatening, you know, uh, to ban the the uh, the use of the BBNs in Myanmar. A number of people also already got arrested, you know, for having you know a VPN installed in their phone, in their electronic devices, and etc. So those are um, uh, the ways military has been uh, trying to restrict, you know, people access to the internet. But um, what we have seen recently is in addition to those, all those kinds of like uh, measures, what we have been seeing about it is military has been um, using uh, um, uh, uh, jamming devices, you know, uh, to be able to shut down, not necessarily just the internet access. They are also basically shutting down, you know, like uh, all, all sort of like a uh, communication devices that's including phone calls and also like uh, walkie talkies and, you know, all others like uh, radios as well. You know, they basically, early um uh, shut it down all the communication um devices you know uh, people on the ground can use so that is also we have seen tons of evidence you know the military use the, the, the jammers um every time you know like uh, they they do these like uh, airstrikes or you know like uh, the uh, rigs on the uh, the villages and you know, etc so those are also what we have seen on the ground so that's a bit of like a, a current um, um, uh, um uh, background on the internet shutdown but when we look at about the figures and you know etc so currently right now um over like a 50 plus townships um next month they are going to 10 two years no internet at all only like in some area they got two g's but not um not all the other uh, so those all these like a 50 plus townships those are in Chin, mainly in chin state sakai region and then magui and also some uh, in kachin state as well and then also kayong state so pretty much like uh, those are the areas current conflicts has been going on between these like a uh, resistant forces and also the military so that is like at uh, right now um uh the people on the these townships, you know, what they are experiencing about it is they don't really have any information, not necessarily just about these like uh, resistant movements. They are also not really getting any information about like uh, um, the, all these like uh, military operations and, you know, etc. So when uh, just to um, uh, give answers to your question, you know, like uh, what internet uh, shutdown, what internet access means you know, for the people in Myanmar. So pretty much like uh, currently right now, the situation for the people um, at, in Myanmar, internet Internet access is pretty much like it. I mean, dead of life situation because like at um, many people, many villagers on the ground, they rely on these like at messages, you know, share each other about this military operation in their region, in their in their villages, and etc. So uh, by shut, I mean, kind of military shutting down all these like uh, communications, um, uh, access communication uh, channels, and by using these like even the jammers and you know like a uh, different orders and etc. People lost the uh, the these kinds of messages. People didn't get these kinds of messages in events. So that's why they don't really know about like uh, this military operation in their village, military entry into their village, and also they don't really know how to find the safe route, you know, so that they can flee, you know, this like a conflict area and etc. Many people got killed. Many people got like a kind of like um, uh, what we have been seeing about it, even like a shot down, you know, the, um, the, during this like an operations period and etc. So that's also uh, we see. But in other part, like uh, for example, uh, 
pretty much like uh, the whole resistant movement, you know, relying on these di digital tools, digital devices, digital platforms, and etc. Like uh, from the mobilizing to the fundraising, and also like uh, even like uh, Zoom has been basically rightly used from these different like uh, uh, the uh, resistant leaders, you know, to uh, at different places to be able to uh, to um, uh, to meet and you to be able to discuss and etc. So those are also. I would say it about it like at um uh, uh, in many any area, especially people, especially the groups, you know, who are in these current conflict area, they are they are access to these different devices, different digital tools, dig different digitals, like a communication has been restricted uh because of the internet shutdown. So that was like a, maybe a, a bit of like a broader, like a general picture. Thank you so much, Meta. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um you brought up different ways in which access is blocked and i think uh, that is also kind of linked to the next question that i had for radhika um radhika india is exploring the idea of selective banning uh the telecom regulatory authority has made has has issued a consultation paper on whether that is a less intrusive measure than internet shutdowns which is to say instead of shutting down the entire internet they have suggested perhaps shutting down specific platforms um, that they say, quote unquote, uh, could be used for terrorism purposes and, 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 and other lawful, unlawful reasons. Um, do you think this is legitimate or do you think this is essentially an Internet shutdown by another name? Uh, that's the first leg of my question. And the second, in selecting very specific ways uh, in uh, with respect to blocking the internet, how does it affect the digital divide? Because often um, mobile internet is banned, even though broadband is available, but that means that uh, most people in perhaps rural areas that mostly rely on mobile internet stay in the dark more than people in urban areas and so on and so forth on rounds of gender and, and economic status um, and, and so many other vectors. So just your thoughts on selective banning and um, digital divide, separate or connected as you like. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I think the first uh, uh, case of selective banning is what we saw in Kashmir. This was in the year 2021. I think this is, uh, I mean, they, after 552, I mean, this is a uh, total period of 552 days to more to low internet. What they did there was, on because there were a number of litigations that were going on in court, uh, they said that what we're going to do is they're going to give you 2G internet and we're going to whitelist a couple of websites, right? So think of it this way, if there is a whitelisting of websites that that's done, for example, I'm using an, uh, a bank website. The bank website is whitelisted, but the uh, bank website slash login is there. So it's as ineffective as in the first place. Plus, all of our websites are now designed to load on 4G networks. And uh, loading a website on a 2G network is a very hard thing to do. Okay. Uh, this was when we, what we saw in 2021. Now, coming to the latest example, which is of the state of Manipur, which has had over, I think, now 120 days of internet shutdown. Uh, according to in India's rules, there's something, uh, the telecom suspension rules, there's something called uh, that internet shutdown cannot be indefinite. Right? So, on paper, what they've done, uh, the authorities in Manipur, what they've done is they lifted the shutdown. But they've only said that uh, shutdown is lifted for people uh, who use broadband internet and there are a uh, hundred conditions that are attached to it. The problem is out of a hundred conditions, mo may, uh, most people can't understand. Right? They have to log in, log out every day. They can't change their passwords. Um, you know, there can be surprise chats, etc., etc. Right? It's also interesting to understand that India's, uh, the way that India uses internet is according to the TRAI report, 96 to 97 percent of India's mobile internet users are mobile internet users. Because mobile data is cheaper, broadband is a little more expensive, only 2 to 3 percent of people have access to broadband internet. So if you're shutting down internet and saying it's a partial internet shutdown by only shutting down mobile internet services, you're saying that 95, 97 percent of people will not have internet. Then there is, of course, throttling uh, thing, something that we saw during the farmers protest in India. Again, these are not verified. So you there's no order. So if you're putting jammers or if you're throttling internet, you don't have to have an order, which means that if I, uh, which means that in a protest area, there is a throttler. 
my access to internet becomes very very limited or no internet at all but i don't have a but that thing cannot be challenged because there's nothing on paper right coming to the last bit of the question the selective banning of apps right they said that ott so uh, we uh, again i'm sure there'll be studies to prove this but number of so there are things like facebook marketplace instagram business you know, you know uh, people do business over whatsapp there are so many of your uh, whatsapp now also has a payments option right so when you just shutting down internet selectively uh, a there is a way around it by using vpn b it's also it also comes with its own sets of harms so selective banning is definitely not the way forward internet shutdown by itself a bad whether they be whether they're selective or whether they you know blanket they are bad right even if you can't even cut someone's access to facebook it's as simple as that you have to find other ways to you know control law and order situations plus i think this narrative that shutting down internet or you know preventing uh, videos going on whatsapp uh, you know is the way to control law and order that is also not a narrative that's proven there's also a lot of counter speech that happens on these platforms you know there uh, uh, people if there is hate speech and there's also counter speech so i think uh, strengthening our efforts to sort of you know invest more in counter speech figuring out ways to uh you know de- debunk that narrative uh, investing more in fact checking uh, should be the one should be the way to go not selectively banning any kind of internet service thank you so much radhika uh, usama are you here i don't think usama has been able to join uh, just yet so perhaps uh, mr farooq faisal if i could come back to you um could you tell us a bit more about how internet shutdowns disproportionately affect uh, relatively more vulnerable groups within society such as human rights defenders and and in the case of bangladesh there have been instances of refugees being particularly affected uh, th- that's the first uh, limb of the question and the second given that bangladesh will also soon be having elections uh, are there particular risks around elections that uh, shutdowns could pose and and is there any kind of direction that you would have on 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 how that should be addressed thank you very much uh, and uh, yes i just mentioned that there is a kind of um, control over the access to internet and radio and telephone for the rohingya refugees who are there from myanmar it it's there it's strong and it's there but also the government uh, tries to control uh, all kind of uh, different voices or dissents of the government but the problem is that all the misinformation hate speech etc are spread over the internet by not public mainly it's by the political leaders who are in power because they are the one who are easily can criticize uh, the opposition parties and uh, say anything they want but they use the controlling methodology only for people who are talking against them but also the as we discussed about digital divide in rural areas the government can uh, easily, easily control the speed of the Uh, telephone connections uh, internet uh, connections and etc so however they think that they are not in a good shape that as the government they they use that uh, all the time and the election is the one thing that the government is really worried and in last time uh, last two elections actually it's criticized because they filled up the ballot boxes in the middle of the night and and uh, that's uh, created a big criticism and if the government has the same intention again this year they will definitely go for uh, uh, internet shutdown or content moderation and etc so that that is a danger that bangladesh is about to face so 
we are not in a very good shape at this point of time and january is not very far from here and the government also tries to have the election during the christmas because all the diplomats leave the country for christmas so that they do not want the diplomats to see what they are doing with the election so that that's another uh, tricks that they are trying to play so but uh, the the foreigner countries diplomats especially from g20 countries they are not very happy about that so they are trying to change the dates now and bangladesh election procedure and process and uh, attack on the opposition parties and the shrinking civic space is being criticized by all the european union uh, government and the uh, us government not indian government by the way thank you uh, on that last point actually if i could ask a follow up since we're discussing uh, international impact also and and uh, the the view that other countries have held on this issue we have seen with various other issues such as the data protection law or or efforts to regulate ott platforms it appears that south asian countries are borrowing a lot from each other um for example within the data protection laws we've seen uh, bangladesh sri lanka pakistan india all of them pushing for a certain kind of data localization even if it is later relaxed so uh, in that context do you think with respect to internet shutdowns south asian countries or or maybe bangladesh specifically are drawing a kind of um legitimacy and and perhaps inspiration uh, in a negative way from india which has imposed so many shutdowns over the last five years leading the count uh, on track to do it for the sixth year in a row yes i agree with that bangladesh follows uh, lots of indian steps and actually the digital security act has been copied from by uh, india as well whatever was possible and the ott control act uh, has come to bangladesh it's not yet law but they will do that then data protection law that's like we follow the indians way a lot in that sense but the problem is that the data protection is actually not protecting data because bangladesh does not have the capacity of keep the data of the citizens secure because we are sending all the data outside uh, bangladesh uh, to for storage and the problem is that uh there was a hacking uh, happening in bangladesh uh, all, all the time and a new uh, uh, information about hacking has come out and uh, there was a big hacking of people's identity and etc and also bangladesh bank was uh, robbed online uh, already and it has not been uh, what you call uh, properly investigated because people say that some people who are close to power are involved with this uh, robbery uh from the central bank so yes we we follow some of the indian ways but also we do not try to protect the data and uh, safety and security of citizen online which is very important for a country like bangladesh which is weak and does not have the infrastructure thanks thank you um with you i mentioned in the introduction that internet shutdowns are often used to shield abuse uh, in conflict uh, regions and i think myanmar is among the foremost examples of this within asia uh, you also spoke about how 50 regions within myanmar have uh, been under an internet shutdown for two to one and a half years straight now um could you tell us a little more about the ground realities that the international community is not seeing the impact of shutdowns in these regions that is not visible um and also if um, and i'm not sure there is an answer to this but if there is other regions that have managed to regain access after being under shutdown are there any specific patterns there um, are there ways in which the international community has perhaps helped move the needle um 
I, of course, the variables are very different in a democracy versus in a region like Myanmar. Um, so, uh, but are there any trends or patterns there in terms of regions that now have access and did not earlier? And again, um, the realities that are not visible to us because of this information blockade. Thank, thank you, Namita. I think like, uh, yes, the internet shutdowns in Myanmar, like uh, these all these 50 plus townships are facing are quite prolonged. You know, this is like, uh, um, I mean, over two years time, no internet at all. So you can imagine like uh, the impacts, you know, on the ground quite severe um, in a different ways. Um, uh, so uh, what we have been seeing about it, like especially like, uh, and also these are the areas military has been committing like uh, um, uh, various atrocities, you know, on the ground, um, um, including including like airstrikes, you know, bombings, you know, on the villages and, you know, et cetera. So uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the obvious challenges um, um, uh, we has been experiencing, uh, including us and also others like uh, actors, like media and et cetera, to be able to understand, you know, what is going on on the ground and et cetera. Like, for example, like at, um, uh, last year, like uh, even to be able to verify, you know, internet shutdown and, you know, et cetera, it is also quite challenging for us, you know, to be able to verify, you know, from outside, you know, so that is uh, one reason. That, uh, the other thing is like um, uh, some, uh, some area, like for example, like at, um, because we are also talking about like um, the, the bor uh, borrowing countries and, you know, et cetera, like for example, Naga, like a self-administrative uh, zone area, you know, is this a border with India? Nagaland, the uh, the um, northeast uh, western part of the, the uh, Myanmar. So uh, that area, like uh, they don't have internet since uh, March 2021. So currently, right now, they only rely on the internet. Um, some are like only in a very like a uh, remote like uh, area from these like uh, India SIM cards and you know etc. They use right. So this area, what we have been hearing about it, like uh, because since the very beginning of the coup, you know, they got they faced the internet shutdown and etc. So they don't really know what is going on in the rest of the country so they they totally miss the whole kind of like a bigger picture of these um uh, these uh, revolution like a resistance different resistance uh, movements and uh, you know etc so the information uh, people in in, in the nagat um, area uh, what the, the information they receive is only through the channels you know filled out by the military so pretty much like a misinformation you know like a killings by these like a resistance force and you know etc all these like a misinformation disinformation so that is uh, one thing we being kind of like a, here but the thing is like we still need to, uh, to understand better you know what have you know, these kinds of like it um how this misinformation disinformation and propaganda of the military have impacted you know the um, people in the naga views on the uh the, the general you know like at uh the the whole resistance and etc so that is also one thing the other one is like uh, I would say it about like for example, um, uh, um, uh, recent like uh, uh, nugget, uh, sorry, sorry, recent uh, cyclone, you know, um, um, situation. So this is the area hugely. Um, um, uh, the cyclone hit it like the areas which has been international uh, facing internet shutdown, like that's including Rakhine, Chin State, and then then the Sakai region. So what we have been seeing about it, like um, the people on the ground time to time, you know, tell us uh, when they have the internet or when they go to the point, you know, they get the internet, et cetera. So they are explaining about their their situation on the ground, you know, access to like a humanitarian support as a kind of like a, a, the issues around on this like medical support and, you know, like urgent emergency need and, you know, et cetera. So those information, it is really difficult, you know, to find um, in the local media or so international media and etc. And then also like uh, to, uh, uh, we see it about it, uh, this is also basically restrict, you know, like uh, um, an international body like UN and, you know, others like uh, to be able to enter into these regions and then to be able to reach the, like uh, these assistance, you know, reach to the, the, the people on the ground and etc. So that is also uh, currently like a uh, major challenge. Every time we got a chance to talk with them, you know, these stories we've been hearing a lot as well. The other one I also would like to mention about it is particularly particularly on the education sector. So education sector is like a um, um, majority of the students, pub, uh, public school students, um, and also majority of the public school teachers are point counting uh, uh, against the public school under the control of the military. So compared to the data before the coup and then like the data from the late 2022, um, over 60% of the, uh, the students in the basic educations are not joining to the going back to the public schools this is what the are, kind what of what are the challenges pro 
challenges, yeah. progress, and social perspective for digital economic in Asia. The digital economy in Asia has been significantly growth and uh, transformation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, Mr. Bikram Shrestha. Uh, could I request that you um, put in your question in chat, or I'll, I'll definitely come to you in the question and answer round. I just want to make sure if you have a chance to complete her point, and we'll definitely take that. Thank you so much. Yes, sorry. So, uh, so basically, like, uh, sorry, just to continue, uh, particularly like education, I, I was saying about like a 60% of the students in the uh, the basic level education and also 70% of the students, the university level students um, are not going back to the public school. This is the fourth consecutive year study from the COVID uh, situation. So, um, I mean, because of the, if it is like it, I'm not really uh, saying any comments on the, the acquisition, like point counting, like a public school and et cetera. But like, uh, if we have the internet access, you know, like uh, at least like, uh, I mean, these students can join, you know, online education, online different like uh, education initiatives and, you know, et cetera. But right now, um, um, Basically, um, this area, especially Chin, Skyn, and the Kareni state, the, the, so there is a prolonged internet shutdown. Students on the ground are also not even able to find an alternative education as well. So that has been, I would say, about majority of the students, not like a kind of you know, 10 to 20%. It's just like 60 to 70% um, from the kindergarten level to the university level. So that is like internet shutdown really restricting, you know, like a, this um. Uh, the, the kids, you know, access to the education. That is also, um, so we have been seen on the ground as well. And then back to this, like, and matter you are last question, uh, particularly like, at, um, for example, like uh, Rakhine State, right? Like Rakhine and then the southern part of the Chin State, there was that the, the, the before the coup situation, they also experienced prolonged internet shutdown under the NND government. Um, to, th there was also the time during this, like, at, um, the, the conflict, like, at, between Rohingya and then, like, at, um, the um, military and etc. So at that time, like at uh, currently right now, what we have been saying about like a different like a NND members, they have been saying about they could not really understand well what is going on about the the, 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 the whole kind of like a bigger picture of the conflicts because of the restricted in uh, the access to the information. So that was like, uh, they said that now only after, you know, they have uh, access to the, be able to talk to the people on the ground and etc. They start realizing how serious it is, you know, and also like uh, they also start seeing about this kind of like a manipulation propaganda campaign of the military and etc. This can be an uh, excuse from the uh, and indeed um, the government, but somehow that's also sort of like it. I would say it about it as a bit of like a reflection, you know, a bit of like a learning lesson. How the uh, the internet shutdown basically restrict, you know, people understanding on the uh, the uh, this ground situation, and also so how people kind of like get um, uh, uh, take on into this like a uh, different like a uh, propaganda, you know, of the military and etc. So I would say it about it like uh, this is a uh, kind of like a uh, evidence, you know, this is the lesson you know we can take on you know how internet uh uh, assess an internet shutdown basically can make a kind of like a different, you know, and people understanding about such serious like uh, um, like um, uh, um, uh, conflict situations in Myanmar and etc. So yeah, those are yeah um, um, yeah may maybe I will I will stop here right now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, maybe before I go to the third question, we could take a couple of questions. There is one in the chat uh, for Radhika from uh, Prateep Thomas. Um, and I know there was one more from Bikram Shreshta. I'm not sure if they're still here. Uh, but if you are, uh, please feel free to ask the question after uh, Pradeep Thomas's question. Um, Radhika, don't you think that the government of India's many internet shutdowns are calculated attempts to deprive minority communities of their right to information? Is the question from Pradeep Thomas. Right. Thanks, Pradeep, for the question. I uh, I think that uh, internet shutdowns not only restrict people's you know um, uh, right to information, they also prevent political participation, especially for minority com communities and um, and women. Right. As, <coughs> sorry. As a woman. I think you'll find it hard uh, to say that, you know, uh, we would go out for a protest if there's a shutdown. Because a shutdown generally signifies that there's something uh, that's going wrong, right? And in a country, in countries like ours where uh, social, where, you know, a secure, there are already existing security issues. 
uh, you would not step out. But I do think that uh, you know, uh, internet shutdowns does deprive communities, minority and otherwise, from their right to information, as we saw in the case of Manipur, and you know how those those videos uh, surfaced as soon as there was a little internet that was back. Thank you, Radhika. Um, Bikram Shrestha, are you here? All right, perhaps not, in which case I'll keep us moving. Um, just if you could turn the discussion uh, to employ a slightly more forward looking lens in terms of changes that are possible, advocacy opportunities that exist, and how uh, a positive change can be brought about in terms of um, the the frequency and just the, the internet shutdown as a measure. Um, Radhika, again, uh, maybe to you and then uh, to Mr. Farooq Faisal and Rafio. Um, the Manipur shutdown, which in many ways is still ongoing, it, it sharply put into light how such bans hamper processes and turn regions into black boxes. Um, how can these trends of impunity around shutdowns be changed by various stakeholders, be it the public, courts, media, international spaces? Uh, how can this change be brought about? Thanks, Samrita. I really believe that litigation is the way to go. As we saw the, in India, at least, uh, that a lot of litigation really helped. You know, at least put up some guidelines against shutdown, right? Uh, then I think people, I think I also really believe that, uh, you know, there is this resistance in people to believe that shutdowns are bad. Because people think that it's okay, you know, if they're shutting down the internet for two days and it means that everything will be safe and sound, it's okay. Right? So there's no exploration of alternators, there's no exploration of, you know, the impact of shutdowns, there's barely any work done to actually understand what shutdowns do, right? I think uh, recording lost voices, uh, litigating against shutdowns, I mean, sort of uh, building a public archive of the impact of what shutdowns do uh, to change the narrative around it is, has to be the way forward. And I uh, really think that multilateral fora is like the G20 uh, with their teams. I mean, India and past at least has signed some of these documents where they said that there will not be politically uh, motivated shutdowns. There has to be some international pressure through these foras so that uh, at least like uh, the number of shutdowns uh, reduce. Thank you, Radhika. Uh, Mr. Farooq Faisal, if I could come back to you, um, given that digital inclusion has been an important focus for the G20, um, what role do you think digital inclusion can play in introducing transparency and accountability checks within the state apparatus and this inclination to impose shutdowns or uh, not even blanket shutdowns, just measures to block social media platforms or specific other messaging apps? Um, and Bangladesh has now been cited uh, over the last many years as being an important diplomatic partner for a lot of countries. Um, so how can the people of Bangladesh advocate for this change both within the country and, and beyond? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, anything uh, for a like G20, and I'm sorry the SARC is not working anymore. There should be this South Asian uh, coalition as well. Parallel to the government discussion, I think citizen voices should be heard in these forums, okay? And citizens should have the right to speak. And, and now the World Bank, ADB, and other organizations are give, giving the opportunity of general public uh, to speak at this kind of uh, meetings. And so the my point is that uh, what Bangladesh can do and other, other countries can do as well is creating awareness among the people that shutdown is not acceptable. Why it's not acceptable? Number one is it has relationship with many things. One is the public health. For example, during COVID, if you shut down the COVID and though no news comes out, then you are in trouble. Again, my friend from Myanmar mentioned that uh, natural calamity is something that people need to know. 
and if you shut down the information then is the problem it's there so there are two things one is that creating the awareness among the citizens and connecting with different activists from different countries and work together and also undertake strategic advocacy for their government and others government at the same time i think this is one way forward from my point of view thanks that's very helpful thank you we have a related question for you again in terms of uh, what the way forward is how how we can collaborate how stakeholders can work together and leveraging their own unique positions within the ecosystem uh, if we were to employ an international lens to this um, how can international stakeholders and these summits um, help the people in Myanmar to regain internet access? Yes, uh, then definitely um, when we talk about the internet access uh, in Myanmar, so we are also looking about like alternative communications, alternative like internet access and et cetera. So we definitely need a lot of support uh, from these like at, um, uh, members, countries of G20, like G20 and, you know, et cetera. Like when we look at about G20, like India, we also have uh, like, I mean, the border countries with India, China, et cetera, right? Like, so... Definitely, um, um, when um, we are finding different ways uh, to be able to make sure about like uh, communities, they have the internet access. Uh, um, so uh, we really needed like a lot of like a collaboration from these countries. Like uh, uh, we have a long border with India, long border with the China, and also like for example, and others like uh, India, Beng and, uh, um, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, and etc. So that is also um, um, that the uh, support you know we are also looking into it as well. And then the other thing is like it, um, uh, not necessarily just like a kind of like a, um, a physical kind of border and etc. But the thing is like a, the, the companies like in India, companies in China and etc. They are they are also like a man the uh, the the, um, the countries you know which is like a largest like a satellite companies and etc so this is also um we are looking into it like in terms of technologies in terms of like a government pressure in terms of like a uh, support you know from these like uh, international community and etc to make sure about people in Myanmar, they have the uh, the uh, the alternative like uh, communications um, uh, channels, communications devices and et cetera. Otherwise, like uh, under this military government, we don't really see it about this situation of the internet access where get kind of like it uh, improve, you know, um, uh, we don't really, this is not, not what we have seen um, as well. So that's why we are being, uh, be trying to reach out to these different governments. So we really wanted like a such G, uh, summit like G20, you know, we are um, um, uh, to be able to kind of like get, um, uh, make it like it, uh, these uh, country leaders understand about the situation and then they are kind of like a role, you know, they can play. I mean, the, in the chat, you know, I also see it about it, like internet shutdown is pretty much like a kind of, you know, uh, I mean, is this like a link to the right to uh, to life? You know, that's the case in Myanmar, actually, you know. Uh, um, uh, so that's why, like, it, it's not about, like, it, um, uh, when countries, you know, politics, it's not about, you know, like, a territory issues and, you know, et cetera. Is this pretty much about the right to life of the people in Myanmar? So that's why we really wanted like it um, international community understand about uh, about this kinds of situation and also basically kind of like a coordinated in terms of like uh, putting it efforts you know to make sure about we have these like a uh, different sources for the alternative communication and also at the same time. I mean, to be not what military has been doing is not necessarily just about like uh, stopping internet access uh, by for the people of Myanmar, but they are also doing about it all sort of like a surveillance, you know, on these digital tools, using the digital tools, digital devices, and etc. as well. So we also really wanted like it um, uh, uh, affected like it uh, measures uh, from these countries um, in making sure about like a uh, uh, different like a uh, digital tools, digital. 
devices like a secure um, surveillance tools and etc not to reach to the uh the um the, the hands of the military like for example you know in uh, many indian companies has been involving in these recent um uh the the uh, the uh, developments uh by the military in setting up like uh, for example eid system like collecting biometric and also even like accepting up different data system you know um for the uh the national i uh, building up like a national database system and etc many indian companies has been providing like uh, these uh sort of like a uh, different digital to different digital apps and you know softwares and etc so that's why we really want it like uh, to be discussed and also to make sure about it like it um uh, um, uh, they find a kind of like a common like at um, uh, collective uh, measures, you know, against um, uh, exchange of like uh, these tools, you know, which can be eventually reached to the hands of the military. So that is also how what we kind of like uh, hoping, and then we will be also doing about it a collective effort, you know, like at uh, um, around this like uh, international advocacy, focusing on the G20 summit as well. So thank you. Namra, very clear ask. Thank we you. are getting yes. uh, out of time, and if there is anyone uh, who is present in the room, uh, have any question, maybe we should ask them at this point. I cannot see it. Yes, please. Uh, I'm told we have nine minutes. So yes, uh, folks in the room, please take the floor and ask a question if you have one. Yeah, if there is any question from uh, the audience here. First of all, I want to thank to Mary Piumye. I'm also from Myanmar. I like to share about uh, my country situation a bit more, but her explanation is very complete, and I, I really appreciate for that. And thank you very much, Mary Piu. I am a network engineer in Myanmar, but now I am in Australia. I am also the the trainer in Myanmar. Every communication devices, as Mary Pio said, every communication channels are being shut down, not only the internet, the mobile, the satellite, air, uh, the radio devices, walking, talking, every communication devices are not allowed by the military government. And there are some regions like the guy, Kayen, something, uh, the many regions, around 50 regions, their internet was shutting down. And then in this, in those regions, there are many human rights violations are happening. And then the media cannot come in. The international cannot see that uh, the, the, the thing they are happening are very terrible. And in the education center, since I am a trainer, what I am facing is I am trying to open the, online training and then there are some requests that teacher i want to have the in uh, the online training from you yeah can you open or not and then and then they ask the situation that in their region they want to have the internet but uh what kind of situation they i can help and then actually when i consider about that i have no way or i have no solution for provide the solution to them and therefore the training i try to open the training but they are internet they try to come to the area with the two um, with the mobile internet with 2g 3g but they are not able to access and then i am very difficult to do even difficult to do the training even in the city area the electricity was unstable and then they are not able to assess their education or they are not able to assess the class in my class as well. And another thing is uh, in Myanmar, there is the telecom license is the every ISP, they cannot, they cannot communicate with the IB transit through the overseas provider. Only the, the provider who has the international gateway can connect to the cross-border IB transit. So actually it is illegal, the ISP also some of the, I am also supporting some of the ISP from Myanmar that they want to connect to the the overseas provider and then want to, they, they block everything like Facebook and ban their Facebook and then so they want to have the solution but I could not provide that because it is illegal with their license, it is illegal to 
provide the connection with the overseas provider. So it is not possible. So every aspect is very difficult to get the internet and shutting down the internet. And then there are various ways of IP based blocking. And then they are also with the not recently also they are forcing the people to register their mobile SIM cards with their name. And then for is this a question? I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay. Yes. It's a question. Yes. Okay. Apologies. Yeah. Uh, this is very helpful, but I just want to make sure we others also get a chance to ask, and we need to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, okay. So, thank you very much. And that's all. I think uh, for the last part of all, we need the international support, like what he he said that the neighbor country we need the. We need the communication channel and then try to to support the the possible ways for the especially for the region who doesn't have the internet. We want to have the like the satellite devices, like the Starlink coverage, Elon, uh, Star, something like that. Those kind of solutions are we are needing, and then also. I want the international. I want to request to the international that not to reach the like the surveillance devices. It is very harmful, and then the people they are trying to use those technologies for the the AI technology, and then they are thank trying to catch. Much. Yes. You only have two. Uh, thank you very much, yeah, and then thank, thank you for very much. yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions in the room? Um, I, I know there's one question in chat which Vipio touched upon, but if uh, Radhika or Mr. Farooq Faisal, if you want to weigh in on the right to life and the internet, but first, any other questions in the room? I don't see. Okay, one question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just a very quick one. Um, I wanted to know for all our participants who have been attending APRIGF so far, and I've met, uh, I'm, I'm a mentor myself in APRIGF, and I wanted to know what are your lived experiences after you go back? For anyone who is speaking, I'm, I'm actually very concerned about your safety, even after you speak in a forum like this. How about the safety of your family out there if you become their voices here? Is there anyone who actually takes care of this? Is there any form of protection available? Thank you. Anyone online wants to answer or? Um, I think I can go and I can couple it up with Alman's question. I uh, do, I think at least for us in India, we've not reached that stage yet. A lot of us who are working in small civil societies, uh, we're all, um, you know, sort of, uh, of course, concerned, especially uh, for organizations.